Welcome back to the Chris Gates Fitness Podcast. Thank you so much for joining me. I am super excited to dive into today's, today's episode, which is going to be another q and I've got five really good questions for us to dive into, as well as a sixth uh, bonus question that uh, I have gotten quite a bit from my clients lately and something I've also experienced and managed myself lately. Uh, so let me run through what all these questions are that we're going to get into on the podcast today. So the first one, is range of motion overrated when it comes to doing heavy dumbbell presses? And I actually want to take that one a step further and have us talk about just is range of motion overrated to begin with? Or does it matter for your goals? So we're going to dive into that. Um, question number two, how long will it take to increase arm size if you're an intermediate lifter? And this is another one where we can kind of take it one step further and just say, if you want to build muscle and you're an intermediate lifter, so you've been lifting consistently for you know at least a, a couple years now, um, how long is that going to take? That's a really good question. Uh, question number three, is it better to work out 20 minutes a day, three days a week, or 60 minutes, one day a week? So if you only have a certain amount of time that you can allocate each week to exercising, uh, what's going to be better for you? We'll dive into that. Question number four, are soy chunks a great source of protein? I have not gotten that one before, so we're going to dive into it today. Uh, and question number five, what should you do if one arm is weaker than the other? How can you balance out both? So th those are the five questions. That last one <clears throat> is going to be about, um, you know, if there are imbalances in your physique, how can you make those imbalances less noticeable, less, less prominent, uh, or eliminate them altogether? Um, and then the sixth question how to prevent your weight spiking up. So how can you prevent, you know, just having those situations where you're weighing yourself regularly, one day you step on the scale and holy shit, it's three, four, five, seven, eight, ten pounds up from the last time you stepped on the scale. We're going to talk about that. That's the one we'll actually lead things off with uh, here in just a moment. But before we dive in, uh, as always, like to remind you that I am a coach. And if you are looking for some help in your fitness journey, uh, whether it be building muscle, uh, burning fat, just developing healthy lifestyle habits, maybe doing all three of those things at once, uh, and getting some customized, uh, personalized programming and coaching for you. Um, that's what I do. I work with people all over the world to do those things, build muscle, burn fat, develop healthy lifestyle habits, and really just kind of improve, improve your health through fitness and nutrition. Um, and uh, I would love to work with you if you are looking for a little bit of help. Uh, what I do is really guide my clients step by step. I help hold them accountable to the things that they're supposed to do. And we also uh, make sure that I'm just taking all the guesswork out of things for you. So if you say, hey, I have this goal, what do I have to do to achieve it? I'll help you put together a program to make sure that you can just show up, put in the work and have confidence in what you're doing and know that it's going to be working. So uh, there will be a link in the show notes to this episode, whether you are watching on YouTube or if you are uh, catching this anywhere you listen to podcasts check out the description for the show. There's going to be a link to my coaching page. You can click over to my website to learn more uh, at chrisgatesfitness.com. Um, and uh, if you are listening, wherever you are listening, uh, if you could make sure that you're subscribed, that would be great because then you can get every single episode the minute it's released. And uh, if you wouldn't mind taking a minute or two to leaving a rating and a review, that really helps my podcast get in front of more people. And that's the goal here is to put out episodes every single week that can help you and help other people uh, by sharing the right information, right? I mean, if you've listened to any of these episodes uh, over time, you know we're not sharing a lot of gimmicks and fads and uh, hacks and tricks. <laughs> it's really uh, stuff that works and, and, and answers to questions and strategies and game planning that I work with my clients on and it ends up working out for them and I share it here with you too so that uh, hopefully it can help you and help other people. So if you can leave a rating or review, that really helps me reach more people, uh, which helps more people achieve their goals and I would really appreciate it. Um, but with that said, you know, talking about coaching, the people that I work with and, and, and questions that they often get and ways that we navigate through them. Let's dive into that bonus question first. That bonus question is how to prevent your weight from spiking up. And this is one that, I mean, I deal with 
my clients all the time. And, and uh, honestly, I wanted to toss this into the mix for today's episode because I've been getting this question a lot lately. Um, and, you know, I, I with the type of people I tend to work with, I work with a lot of football fans and we run into these situations where, you know, you have uh, a really solid, consistent week and then you have a football game on Saturday or Sunday that has either like a get together with friends at the house or you go to the game. So you have a tailgate, you're having beers and food at the game. You step on the scale Monday morning and it's like as many as five to seven pounds up from what it was on Friday morning, right? So in the matter of 24 to 48 hours, you're like, oh my God, this is awful. I totally undid all of the good work that I put in over the week in one to two days. And, um, you know, even me, I, I, I literally, the morning of recording this podcast, experienced the same thing. So I'm recording this podcast on Sunday. On Saturday, I went to a football game. I had a couple beers. I had a couple burgers, a hot dog. Um, and I stepped on the scale this morning and my weight was up like a pound and a half. And so that's one example is going to a football game. Obviously, if you're listening, it could be based on any number of factors um, but like this concept of how to prevent your weight from spiking up is one that I talk with my clients about a lot, regardless of the circumstances, because I think it's actually really important to understand why your weight does spike up. Like, why do you have fluctuations in your body weight and what do those fluctuations mean? Because I think what people most of the time worry about is that my weight went up three, four five, six, seven pounds in a day what did I do yesterday? It must have been wrong. And uh, that is really not almost ever the case. You know, sometimes you can have, I I guess, like a a day where you just like totally go off the plan and you eat all of the wrong foods and uh, you overeat calories by thousands and thousands of calories. That can happen. But I feel like that's like the rare outlier. Most of the time, it's that you didn't necessarily do anything wrong. You just did things that were different and outside of your normal routine. Um, and so when I run into this situation with clients that I work with, uh, it, uh, one of the first things I, I like to mention is, listen, your weight spiked up. Um, and I know you're worried that that means, okay, the, the scale is f- up four pounds today. Let's just use that, four pounds. I know that you're worried that you gained four pounds of body fat yesterday, but let's talk about what would be required for you to gain four pounds of body fat in one day. Because realistically, it is, I mean, damn near impossible. It really is impossible for you to gain four pounds of body fat in a day. It is really, really hard and damn near impossible to gain one pound of body fat in a day. Um, it's kind of like a ballpark number. You may have heard this before, but one pound of body fat is equal to right around 3,500 calories. Meaning, like, we can really simplify this if you, if you want to take it in this, this direction. That would mean you would have to overeat by around 3,500 calories to gain one pound of fat. And that doesn't mean you need to eat 3,500 calories. That means 3,500 calories over whatever your maintenance is. So if your maintenance is like 2,000 calories, that means you'd have to eat 5,500 calories that day for you to gain a pound of body fat. And even at that, you probably wouldn't be gaining a pound of body fat because, you know, depending on your level of activity that day, um, there's a lot of different factors that could actually mean you would probably even have to eat more than that to gain a pound of body fat. So to gain four, <laughs> you're talking about 14,000 calories, I think, if I'm doing the math right, 14,000 calories over your maintenance is impossible. You could never eat that much. You would, If you tried to eat that much food in one day, uh, you would end up vomiting and you'd throw up most of the calories that you put in your mouth. So like, it's a really important thing for people, people to understand is that like when you step on the scale and it's up a few pounds from the day before, the vast majority of that is not body fat. The vast majority of that is water weight. And the reason we retain water weight, 
Well, there is not one reason. There are a number of reasons why we retain water weight. Uh, It could be because you had more carbohydrates than usual. Oftentimes, if you're eating more food than usual or eating different foods than you usually do, there's probably going to be some more carbohydrates in there. Uh, There could be more sodium in there. So let's say like you went out to dinner or maybe you went out to lunch and dinner in one day. Uh, If the food is prepared at a restaurant, chances are it may have a lot more sodium in it than foods that you would normally prepare for yourself at home. So you have a lot of sodium in there. Sodium causes your body to retain water and you're just holding on to a lot of water. Um, the alcohol can make you retain water as well. So if you go out and you have a few drinks with friends or something like that, you go to a football game, a tailgate, you have some drinks. There's a, an easy reason to explain why you're so much heavier on the scale. It's because you're retaining a ton of water weight because you drank alcohol and it makes you bloated. Uh, and then it could also be like if, if you did eat more food than usual or if you ate outside of your normal routine, maybe you ate more food later in the day. So when you wake up the next day, step on the scale, you just have more food weight in your system than you normally would. Um, That's not body fat. That's just food sitting in your digestive tract and it hasn't fully, you know, processed through your body. I don't want to get too gross here. Um, There are so many different, all of that is to say, there are so many different things that can cause your body weight to spike up. And I don't think that any of those things are, if we want to go back to the question of the day, how to prevent your weight from spiking up, I don't think you should go into it thinking, I need to do everything possible to prevent my weight from spiking up. Um, All of those things that we just walked through, all those scenarios and situations are perfectly normal and, and honestly, things that you should be allowed to do. You should be allowed to go to a football game and enjoy yourself and not freak out about it and just understand that your body weight's going to be a little bit heavier because you're retaining some water weight. If you get back to your normal routine after two or three days, probably the vast majority of that water weight's going to come back off and you'll be back down to your normal weight by Tuesday or Wednesday, whatever it may be. You should be able to go to dinner or go out to lunch or go out and have some drinks with your friends. You should be able to eat different foods on the weekends and stuff like that. These things aren't bad. You shouldn't rein in your lifestyle to the point where you're avoiding all these things that could make your weight spike up um, because you don't like to see the weight spike up. Like we've already explained, I've explained this pretty well so far, I think, is that like it's not body fat. You're not putting on body fat. You're putting on water weight and that's great because water weight will come off. It's very easy to get water weight come up, to come off and you don't have to do anything special. You don't have to like get, get buy a cleanse or a detox tea to get the water weight to come off. Uh, you're just going to probably pee a lot more for like two days <laughs> and it's going to come off and it's going to be fine. Um, so again, how to prevent your weight from spiking up. I don't think you should do anything to prevent your weight from spiking up. That is a very normal physiological response from your body based on the circumstances that you were in. Um, So, you know, I feel like a lot of what I do as a coach is often, especially when people, I bring people new uh, in and we start working on their program within the first month or so, month and a half, there's always a weekend where like, you know, we see progress moving in the right direction week after week after week. And then there's, there's always a weekend there in the first month or month and a half where, um, the weight spikes up. It's, it's going to happen, right? It's a normal, like I said, it's a normal thing for your body to do. And then when your weight spikes back up, you know, it's, I find myself in the situation where I'm like coaching people on water weight. (laughs) And I always say like, this is a great, this is a great opportunity for you to continue stepping on the scale, continue to get back into your normal routine and see how your body reacts to all of this. Um, Because it's going to go back in the right direction. And you're going to learn the more that this happens that like, it's not something you need to freak out over. It's just something you need to understand. And, And you need to understand that then like on the back end of it, when you see that happen, you don't need to do anything rash. You don't need to make crazy changes to your lifestyle. You just need to get back to what you were doing. And it's going to all normalize itself uh, and you're going to be fine. So uh, don't do anything to try to prevent your weight from spiking up. Just get back to the normal routine. And I think it's going to be a very educational experience for you to see how your body weight trends. Uh, And then the more you do this, the more you're going to be comfortable and understand what's happening and it won't be that big of a deal. 
All right, question at number two, is range of motion overrated when it comes to heavy dumbbell presses or any exercise? Is range of motion overrated for building muscle? The answer is no. <laughs> range of motion is extremely uh, beneficial for you if you want to build muscle. Because, you know, if, if you want to simplify just the process of building any one muscle group in your body, it really comes down to moving that muscle the way that the muscle wants to move. So an easy one is like a bicep curl. If you're standing with your arms at your sides, hanging down, you know, next to your hips, um, to work your bicep, it's really about bending your elbow and bringing your wrist up towards your shoulder, right? Like you want to be bending your elbow because your bicep inserts at your elbow and then your the top of your bicep inserts up into your shoulder. So you kind of want to bring those two points closest together, closer together. Um, if you want to train your chest, if you want to build your pecs, and this question was about a heavy dumbbell press, you want to be bringing your arm out in front of your body and into the midline because your pec, your, the muscle fibers of your pec are kind of concentrated over in your shoulder and then it connects in the middle of your chest and your sternum. So you want to bring those two points closer together. It's really like that for every single muscle. So if you're only doing a partial range of motion for any one of those exercises, then you're not going to be stimulating as much muscle growth as you possibly could. You're not going to be challenging that muscle as much as you possibly could. Uh, you're not going to be getting the maximum benefit of the exercise. Um, and you're not going to be moving that muscle fully in the, the movement pattern that it wants to move in. Uh, so range of motion is, is very, very important for really any muscle group or any exercise that you're doing. Now, with that said, people do have limitations, and if you have, you know, past injuries, uh, or if you're currently dealing with some type of nagging pain or something like that, there can be, in my opinion, a use for partial range of motion exercises. Uh, but that's really kind of like more fewer and far between, and very case specific, based on some type of limitation you have with your musculature or your skeleton. Like, you know, there are. Actually, I'll use an example. I was recently in the not too distant past dealing with uh, a bit of hip pain, lower back pain and hip pain. And so I had to adjust my squats where when I was doing barbell squats, instead of going to full depth and then standing back up with the weight on the bar on my back, what I did was I put a chair there to prevent me from going down past that point where I would start to feel pain in my hip because I wanted to let my hip and I wanted to let my lower back be able to recover. But at the same time, I still wanted to be able to train. I wanted to continue to train my legs in some way. So I did what's called a barbell box squat where I sit down on the chair and then I stand the weight back up. That's a partial range of motion. That was very appropriate for me in that given circumstance, um, and so that made a lot of sense, and that's, in my opinion, a, a use of partial range of motion that makes a lot of sense. For a dumbbell press, you know, some people do deal with shoulder pain when dumbbell pressing, whether it be if it's a flat press or if it's an incline press. I've had, with all the people I've worked with over the years, I've seen a lot of people have struggles with incline dumbbell bench pressing where it just, you know, no matter where, how we play around with the incline of the bench, uh, it puts your shoulder in just an uncomfortable position. So what we've done sometimes is found that like, you know, if you kind of break that point of depth where you're doing an incline dumbbell bench press if you get to a point where you lower the weight down and, and it gets really deep and it causes you pain, well, maybe we don't necessarily have to go that deep. Maybe we can stop right before that point of pain and then press the weight back up. Are we going to be getting the maximum benefit from that exercise? No. But is it going to be beneficial for you? Can you still get a lot out of it? Of course you can. And uh, those are some, some instances where I think like partial range of motion makes sense. But if you don't have limitations, and so for the person asking this question, is range of motion overrated? It's absolutely not overrated. If you don't have any type of limitations like the ones I just described, you should not be trying to lift heavier and heavier and heavier and 
just neglect range of motion entirely. Something a lot of people do with heavy compound lifts like a dumbbell chest press is you want to add weight to it, right? You want to get stronger and stronger at it. So you add weight while sacrificing range of motion and form and technique. And then you get to the point where it's like you're doing sets of six to eight with 100 pound dumbbells, but the range of motion is like two inches. You're barely moving those dumbbells at all. And at that point, it's like, well, okay, it's cool. You satisfied your ego. You're lifting with a heavier dumbbell, but you're not getting anything out of that exercise. You're much better kind of like detaching from your ego. And you got to learn how to do that if you're going to lift consistently for a long period of time. Detach yourself from your ego. And instead of focusing on the number on the side of the dumbbell or the number on the barbell, try to focus on how you can make that weight challenging through a full range of motion. Because if you can lift 100 pound dumbbells, but you can only move them two inches, if you were to do 65 pound dumbbells, you could get a full range of motion, really feel the muscle work, really feel it squeeze at the top, stretch at the bottom, get a really big burn, get a huge pump after doing that exercise. That's going to net you more muscle growth and, and a better stimulus long term. Um, so the, detach yourself from your ego. Try to lift with full range of motion uh, if you can. And then again, like I said, if you do legitimately have limitations where you need to scale it back, scale it back. Uh, but otherwise, range of motion is very, very valuable. And I would encourage you to lift with full range of motion if you can. Okay, question number three. How long will it take to increase arm size if you're an intermediate lifter? Um, and, and again, like I said at the beginning, we'll, we'll extrapolate this a little bit and just say like, how, how long will it take to increase muscle size as an intermediate lifter? And um, it's a great question because, you know, I've talked a little bit about this on the podcast before, but uh, a <laughs> unfortunate truth and reality about lifting weights is that the longer you lift, the more consistent you are, the stronger you get, the more muscle you build, the less ROI you're going to have over time, the harder it's going to be to continue to make progress and your rate of progress is going to slow down considerably. So once you get past that beginner newbie gains phase, you get into more of a intermediate phase of lifting where you can still make progress, but that progress is going to come at a slower pace and you are going to have to work harder to get that progress. So in terms of how long will it take to increase the size of any muscle group as an intermediate lifter, um, it's hard to say. It can be very person-specific. Obviously, with anything with strength training, there's a genetic piece to the puzzle, right? We all have different genetics. Some people respond better to lifting. Some people respond worse to lifting. There are people that can just blow up by touching a weight. And then there are hard gainers who can put every last ounce of effort into this stuff and barely see any progress to begin with. So your genetics, your personal gene pool is going to play a role for sure. Um, but you know, if you really want to maximize that progress as an intermediate lifter, Here's what I'll say. When you're in that newbie gains phase, when you're a beginner lifter, you can make progress doing almost anything. And I mean that by lifting in any style. Uh, like, so if you want to do, you know, low, low reps, heavy weight, high reps, low rate, powerlifting style, bodybuilding style, Olympic lifting style, you can make progress really quickly doing almost anything. Uh, when you get into the intermediate phase, it's obviously going to get uh, a bit more difficult. And when that happens is when I encourage you to kind of do two things. So we have training and we have nutrition. From a training standpoint, really make sure that you're on a program. Don't just kind of like find things online that you're interested in doing and try them out and keep like program hopping over and over again. You can make progress doing that as a beginner, but as you get into the intermediate phase, you require a bit more of that logical programming. And that's a great way to hire a coach. And if you're interested, like I said at the beginning, that's what I do. Uh, hit me up. But um, 
having a progression where you are in different phases and blocks of training that scales your intensity and workload up in an appropriate manner based on you individually hitting deload weeks, scheduling rest throughout the week, optimizing your training based on everything else you have going on in life. And again, that word progression, making sure that there's a progression there is really, really important because you're going to get to a point where you can't just add five pounds to every lift week after week after week. So when you can't do that, you kind of need a program structured in a way that's going to move you in the right direction. That's number one. Nutrition, number two, is the other thing where it's like as a beginner, as a newbie, it almost doesn't matter what your diet looks like. You will build muscle pretty quickly. The more you get into it, the more consistent you are as you you know, kind of move into that intermediate phase, the the composition of your nutrition is going to matter that much more. So making sure that you're eating enough protein every day, uh, making sure that you're in a slight calorie surplus consistently. Um, and then even the other recovery things outside of that, where, you know, you're trying to limit the amount of stress that you have going on. You're trying to get enough sleep every night, you're trying to hydrate appropriately, a lot of those other details become that much more important. And so as you get into that intermediate phase, it's like, okay, you're no longer a beginner, but you really love this stuff. And you're like, yeah, I'm in this for the long, the long haul, the long term. Well, then you kind of got to act like it, right? You got to get a program that's tailored to you. You got to do the right things outside of the gym because the gym is one, one and a half hours a, a day, a few times a week. That's a very small piece of the puzzle. All the other stuff that happens outside of the gym is really where you determine how much progress you're actually going to make. Um, so you got to get more serious about those details. And if you do that, you can continue to make progress. It's going to be slower. Like I said, it's going to be slower, and that's okay. You got to accept that. But as an intermediate lifter, there's still a ton of progress that you can make. Um, and I, I really think like, you don't run into that situation of working and busting your ass to gain like one pound of muscle a year until you're like nine, 10, 15 years into this journey. I still very much do believe that, you know, if you get into years two, three, four, and five, there's still a lot of progress you can make each of those years. If you're doing all of these things correctly, you just got to get more serious about it, um, both inside the gym and out. So I hope that's helpful. Question number four, is it better to work out 20 minutes a day, three days a week, or 60 minutes once a week? Great, great question. Uh, This is a really good one for anybody listening uh, that is a busy parent, I think, because uh, you have work and you have family and you have all this stuff going on every single day of the week, uh, especially if you have little ones, and you got to kind of like just try to carve out a few patches of time here and there where you can get in a workout and hopefully it's a good workout and you can do something positive for yourself. Um, And I'll start by saying, you know, 20 minutes, three times a week or 60 minutes once a week. So it ends up being the same total time, right? Uh, Which is great. So you have an hour for that week that you can break up and use. Um, Either one of those is a great start. I'm just going to start there. Either one of those is a really great start and you can make progress by doing either one of those options. Uh, With that said, I do really think there's something to be said for having a bit more frequency throughout the week. And, you know, the research really kind of aligns with that too. Um, Let's say your goal is to build muscle. If you're able to train a muscle group multiple times a week, you're more likely to get more out of that muscle group and and see more progress with that muscle group, even if the workouts are short. Um, If you have one long workout a week and you're trying to jam as much as you possibly can into like a 60-minute window for every single muscle group throughout your body... That can be really complicated. It can also be tough because like whatever you start the workout with gets a really good stimulus, but then like as the workout goes on, you get so fatigued that like, you know, if you go head to toe, if you start with your shoulders, you're going to get a great workout for like your shoulders and your back and your arms, but then when you get to like your core, 
you're going to start to feel really tired and you get to lower body, which tends to be the most demanding. Then like you, you're just like struggling to get through these exercises and you're rushing to do it because it's your only workout of the week. That's a really stressful and, and challenging situation to put yourself in. Whereas if you have three workouts a week, 20 minutes each one, you can kind of take each one of those workouts and try to focus on a specific area of your body. So you could do like one lower body day, one pushing day, so chest, shoulders, and triceps, and then one pulling day, so back and biceps. Um, you, so you can devote 20 minutes to like a different segment, a different movement pattern of your body each each day, each workout, and then try to make the most out of that 20 minutes. So like, you know, do a, comp, a heavy compound exercise to start the workout, follow it up with maybe two rounds of supersets and a cool down and you know, that's a pretty good workout right there. And if you do that three times a week, you have the opportunity to hit a couple muscle groups twice if you want to. You get that, you know, more frequent repetition throughout the week, which is good. It's going to have you active on more days, uh, which is always nice. And then, you know, when you get to a point in your routine where you can maybe have a bit more time to train, maybe you can keep that three-day structure and just give yourself 30 minutes or 45 minutes, however much time you find that you can allocate to it. I really like the repetition more. Again, like I said, like either one that you choose, you're going to be able to make progress. Neither is bad, um, but I like having that repetition. And you know that, that example was for building muscle, but it kind of goes for any other goal as well. Burning fat, like if you can be more active throughout the week, like if you can have multiple days where you're exercising as opposed to just one day where you're trying to kill yourself, um, it, it would probably be more manageable. Uh, and it's good to have that frequency of movement throughout the week. Um, and then like, even if it's endurance, if you're trying to, you know, be, if you, if you want to get faster or be able to run longer for longer durations or distances or whatever it may be, again, you have three opportunities, to maybe do like a, a sprint day and then a you know walk and then maybe the third day is like your distance run or something like that. Um, you can be more creative with your workouts. That helps keep things fresh and interesting. Uh, you can challenge different aspects of your cardiovascular system and um, again make it manageable. And and so with any of these these uh, these scenarios, that I go back to what I said before too, where it's like, and then when you get more time, you're already in that rhythm of training three days a week, so you can just build those days out with more depth. So I would probably push you towards doing. 20 minutes a day, three days a week, as opposed to just one day with 60 minutes. Uh, but then also acknowledge the fact that like every week is different, especially if you're a parent, you have little kids. Um, it may turn out that one week you have three days and uh, one week uh, things go crazy and you have to find just the one 60 minute window. And, and perhaps it's good to set yourself up with a plan for both of those scenarios so that you can kind of pull from you know your available options depending on what happens throughout the week. But uh, yeah, I would go with the more frequent approach if you can. I think that that's probably slightly better, uh, but neither of them is bad. Okay, question number five. Are soy chunks a great source of protein? This one will be quick because I have no idea what the hell that is. I, really, I don't know what soy chunks are for protein. I've been in the fitness industry for a while now. I've seen a lot of different supplements come in and out of uh, the scope. And uh, yeah, be honest with you, I've never heard of soy protein chunks before, so I'm going to say no. Um, there's a lot of different forms of protein and, and you know what you should take is going to be based on you individually. Generally speaking, I say like if you can take a whey isolate protein, that's the most complete protein supplement that there is. Um, so, 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 you know, like soy chunks, I'm guessing are like some type of supplement. I would say a whey protein isolate if you can. The, with that being said, like, you know, some people, if you're lactose intolerant or something like that, you may need a different type. Um, or if you're vegan or something like that, you may need a different type. Um, but like, don't stress over the, the form of protein you eat too much because, you know, I even have articles on my website about this. You can 
build a ton of muscle on just a vegan diet. And a lot of people say like, oh, you can't make progress that way. But there's a lot of research that says you can. So I don't think you really need to stress about the source of protein that you eat. You just need to make sure you're getting in enough protein. If you can eat meat, if you are open and willing and able to eat meat, that's going to be the highest quality of amino acids, the highest quantity of essential amino acids that your body needs to build muscle. So that's a great, that's, you know, that's a feather in your cap there. That makes things a lot easier. Um, And if you can't do that, then supplement, right? Uh, There are supplements to help you out to to fill those gaps if you're, uh, you know, on a plant-based diet or vegan diet or something like that. Um, But yeah, don't stress over, don't stress too much over the type of protein that you eat. Just make sure you're getting in enough protein on a daily basis and you're going to be able to make a ton of progress. Okay. Last question of the day. Question number six, what should you do if one arm is weaker than the other? How can you balance out both? Great question. And I think a lot of people deal with this and I can speak from experience. I know like back in my earlier years of lifting, something that I worried about a lot was that my left arm was smaller than my right arm. And it really bothered me. I used to like do more sets for my left arm to try and make it catch up to my right arm. And I really found over time, it's like actually the less I worried about that and focused on it and tried to correct it, the more I saw the imbalance go away. Um, Now let's start with, you know, just like having one arm weaker than the other to begin with is very, very normal. Uh, Almost everybody has that. I would say actually probably everybody has that. Whatever your dominant side is, uh, I'm right-handed. My right arm is slightly stronger than my left arm. That will be the same for you if you're right-handed. If you're left-handed, it'll be the flip, the opposite of that. Uh, And there's not a lot you can do uh, to correct for it because if you just think like all that time leading up to before you started lifting weights, you were doing almost everything with your right arm. You know what I mean? Um, Whether it's, opening doors, writing things down, throwing a football, uh, shooting a basketball, I, you know, like picking up something heavy to move it. You, you almost always did all of that with your right arm. Uh, so over time, your right arm has just built up a lot more strength, uh, a bit more muscle and, that's the way it is. It's not that big of a deal. If you notice that there's an imbalance, you're the only person out there that notices. Uh, and again, I will tell you from experience because I was so uh, paranoid and worried and insecure about that, uh, worried that everybody thought I looked weird because my right arm was bigger than my left arm and nobody gave a shit. Nobody cares. Nobody's looking. Nobody's watching. Nobody cares. Promise. Um, there are some things that you can do, though, that won't make you go like completely crazy trying to correct for it. And and here's the number one thing that I recommend people do. Um, if you have one arm that is weaker than the other, when you do any type of bicep training, and this can go for triceps too, right? Because actually the triceps make up more of your arm than your biceps. Uh, start with the weaker arm. So if you do a set and you're doing Bicep curls, make them alternating bicep curls where you do one arm and then the next arm, then the other arm, then the other arm. You alternate back and forth. Uh, Start with, let's say your right arm is stronger, start with your left arm. And, you know, we talk a lot about what you got to do to build muscle on this podcast. You got to lift close to failure. So as you get close to failure with that weaker arm, whenever that weaker arm maxes out, whenever you get really fatigued and you can't do any more, that's when the set stops. So if you're doing, you know, sets of eight to 10 bicep curls and you get to to rep number nine um, and your left arm just barely makes it up, then you do one more rep with your right arm to get nine with your right arm and that's the end of the set. So your right arm probably had a couple more reps in it. You probably could have, you probably could have done more reps with your right arm, but you're leading with your left arm and matching that performance with your right arm. So that's going to make sure that like you're getting a slightly stronger stimulus to the weaker arm. But at the same time, you're not undertraining your stronger arm because you certainly don't want to do that. And I think over time, you'll find that your weaker arm will catch up to the stronger arm. Uh, you're not going to be able to like totally 
cancel out the the differences in muscle size. The appearance of the two arms may be different, uh, and that's just the way it is. But that's a really simple and easy way that you can kind of try to correct for that. Uh, and that would be the number one thing I recommend that you do. Uh, <laughs> there's some other crazy stuff you could do that I've done, and I don't even want to bring it up because I don't want to plant seeds uh, in your brain. But like, you don't have to. Um, only carry the bags of groceries out of the car with your left arm to make your left arm stronger. There's one. I'll give you that one. That was just stupid. <laughs> it's going to be fine. Nobody notices if you do something little like just trying to match that performance of your weaker arm with your stronger arm. Uh, it'll take some time, but you'll you'll have you'll see the the weaker arm catch up. And uh, that's a great way to just make it easy. You don't have to do like a fully extra set with your weaker arm or anything like that. Uh, It's not that big of a deal. So I hope that helps. And thank you so much for listening to this episode of the podcast. Uh, This was, I enjoy doing these Q and A's all the time. So this was a combination of questions like I said, for my clients. Uh, And I also think I got the rest of these from my Instagram. So if you're not following me on social media, especially on Instagram, I do a Q and A about once a week over there on my story. Uh, just search me at Chris Gates Fitness on every social media platform you will find me. Um, or you can go to my website, chrisgatesfitness.com, and there are links to all, everything uh, on my website. And you can find me basically anywhere. Uh, and like I said, on that website is information about my coaching uh, service. So if you are interested in one-on-one coaching to build muscle, burn fat, uh, develop those healthy lifestyle habits, just get the right program for you to make sure that you're moving in the right direction. I promise we'll move you in the right direction. I will set you up with exactly what you need to do to move in the direction that you want to go. And then you just got to show up and do it. It's very, very straightforward. Um, and there's a ton of support built into it. So if you're interested, uh, head over there, you can check out my coaching page to learn more. And then if you like what you see, fill out an application. I will follow up with you and we can talk more about what your goals are and how we might put a program together for you. But thank you so much for uh, watching. I uh, had a blast doing this episode, watching or listening, right? You could be watching or listening. Uh, Thank you so much. I will talk to you again soon.